Hey, so I think I should I should watch that camera there. So hi everybody from Zoom. Hi everybody here in uh, uh, the room. Uh, so I'm very happy. Zoom and room. Why? Zoom and room. And rum. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm here with two extraordinary guests. I'm very happy that finally we were able to put them together. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura U. Marx and uh, David Rockby. Um, and uh, um, so this is the Art Size Salon and laser event. Um, I should say that uh, we are in uh, this uh, territory that has been occupied by indigenous people for many, many, many thousand years. And before us, uh, there were the Mississauga of the credit, the Euron Wendat and the Seneca people. And uh, I am actually very uh, grateful and I will keep being grateful for being on this land and keep doing my work and sharing the knowledge with other people. So um, this is uh, uh, part of the Art Size Salon, which is uh, a program like this is for the people on Zoom. <laughs> this is a pro program that uh, fa facilitates uh, the intersection between art, science and technology. Thanks for being so brave and coming today, because some of you were also at the concert on Saturday, so I understand that there's a little bit of overload going on here, <laughs> but uh, thanks for coming. And, uh, and yeah, so today we're going to hear some um, very uh, important, so we're going to address some, a, a very important elephant in the room of mm -hmm. media. That's it. Uh, actually, I was telling Laura, uh, 15 minutes ago that uh, we had this big concert and uh, people were very, very keen to have super high resolution documentation. At the end, I ended up uploading on the Dropbox like, like a huge amount of uh, uh, gigabytes of uh, material, which we really didn't need. So what what, what is happening? What is going on? Why are we so obsessed? And uh, we'll hear uh, mm -hmm. from Laura. I'm sure that she will address all of this. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberta. I, so I, I think that, uh, yeah, David is the technical. Okay, so do, I, do, mm -hmm. do I need to turn? Oh, and, and uh, sorry again. Um, I want to introduce you also to Nina, who is, uh, yeah. You didn't wave at me. <laughs> you know, my brain is not, it's not I know, I know. So, <laughs> so but Nina, what do I do? Do I pee, pee, pee. Start, 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 start. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our, uh, our science, science Salon and also a Leonardo uh, Arts and Science laser events. Uh, we are uh, actually a network. Laser is a network which started in 2008 from Stanford University. And now, luckily, we are in 50 locations around the globe. And it's a totally independent network. And luckily, we remain independent. <laughs> and I would like to gratefully welcome Laura and David, both two people whom I admire for years and years, and I was lucky sometimes to work with them. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Bye. All right. Okay. To me now. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Roberta and Nina, for um, making our little conversation possible. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk um, um, rapidly about uh, the research that I've done for the past um, uh, four years on the carbon footprint of streaming media. And then I'm going to talk about the festival that I founded to recognize this footprint, which is a small file media festival, and show you a few films that are um, uh, no more than 1.44 megabytes per second. But I'll start off with um, the research group that um, I formed in 2000 with uh, two media scholars and two ICT engineers or information and communication technologies. And we worked together for about a year um, uh, looking at the scientific, the engineering and scientific literature um, for evidence to corroborate a claim 
by a, a French think tank called the Shift Project, that uh, streaming video was responsible for 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we, we figured out that although the Shift Project had not calculated this correctly, um, their figure was correct. And we learned a lot about um, uh, the three components of uh, ICT, which are uh, data centers or servers, networks and devices, you know, from computers to phones and uh, smart televisions, uh, the contribution of each of these to the carbon footprint of streaming. Uh, we learned that um, although these technologies have benefited from increased efficiency for, um, for decades, thanks to Moore's law, which is actually not a law, but just a tendency, um, uh, the idea that, uh, that our technologies are going to continue to miniaturize and become more efficient has lulled people into the belief that um, um, you know, we can continue to do more and more with less and less. But in fact, for certain reasons, you know, Moore's law is coming to an end and that uh, the efficiency of data, data centers, for example, is expected to start spiking again in about 2025. And I can tell you so much detail about this fascinating <laughs> research um, and uh, how pleasurable it is for me as a humanities scholar to, um, to do research in computer engineering with, with my computer engineering colleagues and, um, and be able to understand most of that research. Because actually the math is not that difficult. You know, if I remember my high school math, it was actually not that hard. Uh, it was great, it was a great collaboration. And um, uh, the computer engineering colleagues also benefited from working with us is the sound okay? No, no, it's just that uh, I have to check the Zoom, but I don't mm -hmm. hear very well, so I'm going back to you. Oh, that's... So I hope I can try to be as... Oh, do, do whatever you need possible. to, Roberta. Yeah, um, yeah so our uh, engineering colleagues were really interested in this collaboration as well, because um, we found that um, the, the research is very politicized. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we humanities scholars are always kind of looking for. Like, you know, what are the you know, investments of the different researchers? But in, uh, in engineering, that's less often the case. So um, we found uh, three or four different camps of uh, people who are calculating the carbon footprint of the internet as a whole. Um, some who were, you know, and that, these are actually only cal uh, camps within you know, green ICT. Um, so there were some who green information communi communication technologies. So um, there are some who are real boosters of um, um, increasing efficiency and uh, are very confident that um, that uh, our our technologies will will. Uh, uh, increase in efficiency even as we go to 5G and um, uh, you know 4K streaming, 8K streaming, artificial intelligence applications, Internet of Things. Although they also really, and these are mostly American scholars. Um, they all uh, engineers, scholars, uh, but they also are really keen for um, government investment. Um, so they're, and they, they have a very big pub, public voice. And so, and they're connected to the International Energy Agent, Agency. Um, so there, there's like the public voice of um, the carbon footprint of the internet is mostly soothing mm -hmm. and saying, it's okay, folks, don't, don't worry. We're, we've got it under control. We just need more government investment. Um, but, and then there are some who, then there's the slow computing movement, which I love, which uh, started, it was started by some engineers in California, but it, it is a global movement. And they recognize um, the, the necessity to curb this carbon footprint, which I haven't told you, by the way, yes, yeah, streaming about 1% more now, because this was a figure arrived at in 2019. Uh, the internet as a whole, uh, servers, networks, and devices, 
has the same carbon footprint now as the airline industry, which is about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And it is growing really fast. It's growing at a rate of, you know, the electricity consumption is increasing at, I believe, 9% a year. So the corresponding car carbon footprint is also growing, but not that fast. And this is also because uh, global energy sources, global, global electricity sources are still um, about 79% coming from fossil fuels. And it's predicted, you know, even by a conservative organization like the International Energy Agency, that um, uh, renewable, the, the increasing investment in renewable energy is only going to support the increase in uh, electricity needs because you know the world is using more electricity and of course this is mostly us in wealthy countries so and i could say so much about this and um, we could reflect together on why why it's still so um, invisible why this carbon footprint of uh, the internet uh, is still so invisible i think it's simply because um, you know, with, well, if we talk about streaming in particular, um, with other forms of moving image media, uh, film, um, analog video, um, things like DVDs, uh, the, um, the playback, the storage and playback mediums are in the room with you, right? The film projector, the DVD player. But with streaming, you have only the playback medium in the room with you, your phone. Uh, but the storage and the storage and transmission media are elsewhere, far out, far out of your um, attention. They could even be in another country. You know, if you're streaming a video, you know, that's in a data center in another country, which is often the case in Canada. Um, so that invisibility is something that I think has been really taken advantage of by uh, media corporations and telecoms to. Uh, allow consumers to believe that um, our media are immaterial. So that's that. <laughs> Happy to say much more about that, whatever you're interested in talking about and whatever mm. you'd like to bring up, David. And also, I haven't really mentioned the carbon footprints of other things like um, uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, but we can certainly get to that, um, though I'm not an expert in those things. So um, I've been working for these five years with, with my team um, to publicize these uh, really disturbing and depressing uh, figures and also to publicize uh, best practices, um, which we have on our really extensive website, best practices for consumers, for telecoms, for institutions, et cetera, for governments. Um, but also, I founded the Small File Media Festival as a way to, to let the issue be more, known more widely, but also to stimulate artists and consumers of um, movies to think about how we can um, make and enjoy movies that have uh, a tiny, tiny contribution to that carbon footprint. I should say that basically the goal is um, to prevent the infrastructure from expanding further. Uh, and I should also, ah, okay, I'll, I'll go into more detail if anybody asks. Um, so uh, this wonderful festival has been running since 2000. We just did our fourth edition. Uh, we did it live in Vancouver and then uh, streaming online for a week and um, we have a terrific live audiences and a big online audiences. And we also have um, uh, panels, um, lectures. We have a concert and a dance party. Um, uh, we haven't done exhibitions. Now, that, that's a different thing, Nina. This is a small file media festival. Just small. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, we don't do exhibitions. We could, we've, we've thought about it because um, some of our members are really interested in um, you know, so-called obsolete technology and the things you can do with obsolete tech. And we would love to do exhibitions of um, great movies made with um, older technology, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, so our, our criterion used to be 
no more than five megabytes, no more than five minutes. Um, but this year, our criterion is 1.44 megabytes per minute. Um, and this is one to three percent of the bit rate of standard video. And yet, the movies are gorgeous. <laughs> um, and we have a lot of tight, uh, tips on um, the Small File Media Festival website. This is a different website from the research website, but they're linked um, about how to make beautiful movies at a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the normal bit rate. And these go from um, camera selection, you're using an older device um, that begins with smaller resolution. Um, to a composition that anticipates compression, to um, cinematography that anticipates compression, slow camera movement, a shallow focal plane, uh, so that when it is compressed, um, you will still have more clarity. Um, and then other, there's so many fast, fabulous things you can do in compression, such as um, uh, lowering the frame rate, which gives you this wonderful kind of ghostly movement. And I've noticed that there are two aesthetic tendencies among um, uh, the makers of small file media. And one is to try to maintain image quality as much as possible. Uh, and the other is to experiment with compression aesthetics as a medium in itself. So I brought you four movies. Um, I think I'll probably just show clips of each of them, uh, except I think one of them is one of them is very short. Um, so that you can just see a range of these aesthetics and then we'll talk. Great. Uh, well, you're going to handle the lights. Okay. You know how to mm -hmm. just pull down until they turn off. Yeah. And you, I'll, I'll have to unlock my computer for okay. you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, okay, I'm going to start with uh, an, an animation that shows a really kind of time honored way to have a very small file size. This, now this artist, Andrew Roach, he's an American artist. He sent us one or two movies every year and every time he has, he's experimenting with a different way of making a file you know, astonishingly small. So this one here, you can see it's 5.6 me megabytes, and I think it's 20 minutes long. So that is really small, and you will see, you will see why. So let's, can I just open it, or do I need to put it in VLC? Um, yeah, I would, um, I think VLC is, is if you pull down to the, to the, to the, uh, down, down at the bottom oh, there, okay. along to there the far it's, side, it's uh, VLCs there. Okay, go. So let's just watch a bit of this. Okay, we want to restart playback, Welcome I think. Right. Okay. Okay. This is the crew of the Starship Jupiter's Ghost. Oops. What follows are stories reconstructed from the mission briefing of Space Log. Just use that at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Join the crew on their mission. I think if we do this, we'll get rid of the stuff. Several crew people have reported sightings of a mouse. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, a mouse is an ancient earth legend, a small creature that is said to inhabit dreams, uh, possibly just a rodent that caused disease. Uh, it's really hard to say. They are apparently something like squirrels. Uh, apparently they've been extinct for a long time if they ever existed. I don't know. 
What I do know is that there's not one on this ship, and uh, I am starting to get a little irritated with all the people who are claiming that they are. Also, I've had to show my third illegal poker game this week. What, why? Why? Why is anyone playing poker on a starship in a post-capitalist utopia? Okay, utopia might be a strong word, things aren't perfect, but, but this is a game built on deceit and scarcity. We don't need either of those things. Oh, also, uh, the captain wanted me to make note that we made contact with a, a ancient Earth vessel that's about 800 years old. It's like a generation ship, traveling sublight. I don't know, they're real weird, a bunch of clones or something. They're real shy about it. Um, I, I, yeah, reporting that because I was asked to. Andrew's out. Ship's log, Cooper, mm -hmm. Centaurus, Cadatra. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you see, you see how um, Jupiter's ghost manages to have a, um, a very small file size, you know, we're using a time honored animation technique of having only a small number of um, moving elements. Now here is, I want to show you another animation and these two artists, uh, Monique Motu Firth, the animator, and uh, Prophecy Sun, the sound artist, they've sent us a number of um, movies over the years with their unique collaboration. Um, it shows you another way that animation can be small in file size. Just use the lower corner to get rid of the bars. Another great small file movie. Um, a lot of its interest lies in the, the really rich soundtrack. Um, and it, the, the visuals you know, appear to have a lot going on, um, but, but they're actually quite, quite efficient in their, their use of bandwidth. So that's, and I should say, you know, every year, uh, well, the first three years of the festival, we showed, we screened about 100 movies. This year, we, because we had many longer movies, we showed 60 movies, and uh, we received obviously quite a lot more of, than that in, um, uh, in submissions. And uh, we're also starting to work with people in less infrastructured parts of the world, um, places that just don't have infrastructure or places where they're uh, there is war or siege. So we've been working with artists uh, currently, currently in um, uh, Kashmir and Ukraine and Lebanon. Um, so, so small files are also useful for places where you only have a 2G network, either because that's what is there or because as a result of the government's um, besieging people. Okay, so next, I want to show you some, a film with extraordinarily, extraordinary, oops, high quality um, by uh, right, Eric Butler. Now this movie is, um, I believe it's 24 minutes long and 26 megabytes in length, but you would not know it from looking at it. And uh, this artist, he has a number of tricks that I can tell you about, but it's a completely absorbing narrative. So let's watch the first few minutes of this.
Whoops. I think it has a long, slow start, perhaps. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, these, uh, this couple go on to, um, you know, they carry out a domestic creative project, kind of like the couple in the silent film. They, they make a film together, you know, they work out, you know, all the stages. It's a, there's a very kind of um, a DIY um, quality to it and, um, and the sense that they have the luxury of time. To, to make a, uh, an artwork together just for the pleasure of it. 
Um, and you saw that the, uh, the image quality is um, really amazingly good. Like, look at that. You can see, you can see hairs. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that it was a small file movie. So this, uh, this film, um, a project for you by Eric Butler, got the Small File Meta Cinema Award this year because it's reflecting on a, a lot of the ways that um, uh, small files would refer to earlier film movements, such as um, to, to slow cinema, you know, to slow movement, to conventions of silent cinema, um, and other things. So finally, I want to show you the work that got, or, you know, the beginning, because I believe this movie, uh, I think it's 12 minutes long. I think I'm just going to show the first half of it or so, unless you clamor to see the rest um, as it's playing. Mm -hmm. This is the film that won the uh, Small File Golden Mini Bear this year. Uh, and it is an example of um, compression aesthetics and artists taking the, um, uh, the um, affordances of compression software and using them as artistic media. So rather than using compression to, to minimize distortion, they're really working with um, pixel blocks, with data moshing, and uh, with other things that really kind of show the intervention of the software. So uh, let's watch uh, Night Tender by Dag Davidge and Bernice Chow. This has sound. Oh, you turned off the sound. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry.
Okay, so uh, I hope you uh, I hope you see the beauty of um, of this movie, Night Tender, and how um, you know there's it is a live action film. Uh, there's a, a sense of story. There's a sense of uh, figures. Um, the now the the three movies I showed before this were in nice high resolution. I just want you to know. <laughs> um, but this one is working on the compression aesthetics, um, and I think that that very rich soundtrack with breath and this this wonderful um, layered score you know, creates a sense of intimacy, and yet we don't quite you know, we feel what we're watching, but we don't quite see it. And I think that's kind of the quintessence of um, the the kind of small file aesthetics that really pursue compression as a medium. So there are many, many different ways to do that. Um, yes, so, so that's- I just want to follow up on that. Uh-huh, yeah, that's Immediately, because um, there's, there's a story about Nicholas Negroponte at MIT mm -hmm. showing MIT's first experiments in high definition TV. And so he showed on one side, here's your standard definition TV, and then he showed, okay, and this is high definition TV. And everyone was like, oh my God, that's so much better. <laughs> and the only difference was the soundtrack. Oh. It was exactly the same image. Wow. But it was the, and the, so the soundtrack actually mm -hmm. is an enormous contributor to our sense of the quality of the image. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's, let's chat a bit. Yeah, so I find myself thinking about two very different things. One is, on one hand, is very is engineering, getting down bit rates, mm -hmm. um, reduced energy footprint in a very engineering frame, uh, frame of mind. And the other is, is aesthetic, because mm -hmm. there is very much an aesthetics of, well, aesthetics of, of, of glitch and compression artifacts or an, uh, uh, an aesthetics of fighting against the, okay, uh, absolute realism that we mm -hmm. are stri apparently striving for with 4K and then 8K and who knows what, um, ultimately. And I find, um, yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting tension between them. And it, it makes me think about something that I, that, that I wonder about a lot and that I uh, came up in your research quite a bit, um, I think, is the rebound effect, which mm -hmm. has another name too, which I've forgotten. The Jevons paradox. Yeah. Do you want to talk about mm -hmm. that? Because I find that's a really interesting yes. gotcha in this whole scenario mm -hmm. or a trick. Yeah, so the, the Jevons paradox or the rebound effect um, is where um, a resource becomes um, more efficient um, but the greater efficiency results in greater use, which um, uh, uh, cancels out any, um, any savings. So uh, Jevons was, um, he was studying uh, coal, uh, co the coal industry in late 19th century England. And he found that um, when, uh, when coal became easier to mine and the price of coal fell, um, coal consumption increased. <laughs> paradoxically, because people are like, oh, coal's cheaper. Let's just do more and more with coal. So um, with uh, efficient uh, data centers, efficient networks, and efficient devices, um, rather than um, leading people to be more modest in our consumption, we're doing more and more. You know, suddenly, oh, let's, let's have video calls. Uh, let's, let's stream in high resolution. Um, High definition, mm -hmm. add a few more bits. Yes, cetera, 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 let's, yeah. um, let's use AI. Stereo. Simple everyday Double applications. <laughs> yeah, let's have, um, uh, let's have high resolution surveillance cameras. Many, many applications. And it's not, of course, the fault of individual consumers. It's because um, media corporations and platforms and telecoms, um, you know, want to, to hook us on all these technologies. So, but it's, it's a real shame. Um, and, uh, but that, you know. But the a, paradox, it, the paradox creates an interesting problem mm -hmm. in terms of actually trying to make action on this is because, because everyone feels like, okay, oh, it's more efficient, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, 
you know, I'm watching on my phone, so it's not even my computer or whatever. Mm -hmm. But but in fact, there's not you're, they're not getting a neck a nickname mm -hmm. from that. Yeah, there's uh, some engineers who do a lot of work on this. Um, uh, Priest Shine and Shabaji at, in at Bristol University, and they call it the the cornucopia the cornucopia effect that. Um, uh, media consumers are made to think that there's just you know, ev ever, you know, we can have as much as we want. Um, and um, so it does seem that um, uh, people's appetite for streaming, you know, in so many different ways on so many platforms and for so many purposes, you know, hasn't reached saturation. And that's again, not, not even to talk about other um, uh, applications like AI, Internet of Things and cryptocurrency. But you also were talking about the aesthetics. Yeah, so on the aesthetic side, I mean, I, starting from a certain point, like start with the last piece, mm -hmm. which on some level is about, like it makes me think about perception mm -hmm. a lot because it's kind of, because compression algorithms are designed to work with our, with our perception to, to play into what we see and what we don't see. Mm -hmm. um, you can reduce the color resolution because our color sensitivity is not as high as our brightness sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but even beyond that, I'm, like it's fascinating to know about the eye, mm -hmm. that the high resolution part of our eye is about this big at this distance. So the part of, that's why our eyes have to move across the page as we read, because we do not have the mm -hmm. resolution in our eyes to actually recognize um, characters except right in the middle. The rest mm -hmm. we fill in, we, we imagine, mm -hmm. we invent, mm -hmm. um, we invent details as we go along. So there was, uh, there was a lot of research in the, in the 80s, and there's still some research in calling what's called, it's called foveal rendering. Right. So the central yes. part of your eye is called the fovea, mm -hmm. this high resolution part. And so the idea back, I think this was used a lot in early ideas about VR, because they mm -hmm. thought, okay, we'll never get this up to fast enough. So you only render where you know, you have to know where the eye is looking, and you only render the part where the eye is looking in high resolution, and the rest you, you, you leave to mm -hmm. the imagination. Now, what's, what happened was there was a lot of research into that, and then the, the, the speed of, of systems became fast enough that it no longer became an issue. Yeah. And so, so, that, so, again, we have an example of, in a sense that that rebound effect where where even though it is actually a more efficient way you do have to track eyes which is a bit of a downside but there there but w there's a lot of what you're seeing on an on a 4k screen that you're not seeing mm -hmm. a lot a lot on it's mm -hmm. just that where your eye goes you do see that resolution yeah exactly there's some um there's use of foveal rendering as a way to um decrease file size in um uh first person shooter games Mm -hmm. or, or any kind of game, really, because that, that makes sense, because uh, it's rendered according to your, your point of view. Because the center of the screen yes. is where you're looking. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah my, my colleague uh, Radek Shadpowski does, does research on um, smaller file games, you know, things mm -hmm. like low polygon rendering and things. Um, but yeah, it's um, you know, a highly, highly compressed movie like this that has worked the compression into an, an aesthetic statement, it really does, um, you know, my, my spouse called it, called this kind of aesthetic shattering because mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't get the satisfaction of um, looking at something that we understand to be figurative and narrative and getting a sort of confirmation. Instead, it, um, it just kind of shatters our expectations. And yet there's something there's something very beautiful about it, and um, and this movie, like you, know, it's it's you know, maybe I should, it's uh, it just gives you this kind of gothic feeling, and mm. I find it very erotic. Actually, mm. did you find it erotic? <laughs> no. And for my kids, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it was recorded onto a cassette deck, and then they digitized it. Mm -hmm. Could be. It or, looks but, like that, but I believe those are only black and white. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's, but it's a, it, it's, it's yeah, like maybe, that aesthetic. but it is, it is heavily, uh, I think it's JPEG 
-hmm. JPEG, they're, they're also digging into the JPEG, JPEG mm -hmm. compression algorithm, which is where you, you yeah. which is a, re, it's a really characteristic look. Mm -hmm. So the way images are. Yeah, now this up. artist, uh, Dag Davidge, has been um, making, sending a small file movies. I think this is the, the third one that she has uh, submitted to the festival. And, so, and she's really been experimenting a lot with, um, with compression aesthetics. Although I don't know which, press, which uh, um, uh, compression algorithm she used, but that is you know, experimenting. You know, I've, I've been doing it a bit myself because um, uh, we also teach workshops and small file filmmaking and experimenting with, um, with those platforms is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and, I, really, I really, yeah, I really think it's a, a new aesthetic movement. Yeah, I found when I got a 4K camcorder that I instantly became interested in early photography hmm. simultaneously. I went because I saw there was something in the 4K image that I kind of like, you're kind of like, wow. And then I'm going, okay, but like exactly at the same time, I started to go, oh, like these these flat early images, which mm -hmm. which have a have a and because they're not precise, because the, the exposure was so long, they're sort of the quality of those images was speaking to me and really making an interesting comparison. Mm -hmm. And there's, so there's something about the um, allusiveness mm -hmm. the, 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 that we're, we, we need to invest more in, in, yeah. in, in those images. And I think that's a, it really then comes down to a, to, to a longstanding struggle I've had with the fact that sometimes people want to invest themselves in looking at a piece of art that way and sometimes they don't sometimes exactly. they want pixels mm -hmm. plastered into their eyes mm -hmm. and it's uh, um, aesthetically i mean aesthetically i find high resolution low resolution fascinating mm -hmm. the challenge on a global scale is how you're not going to wean people from Netflix mm -hmm. onto this yeah. in the current mm -hmm. scenario. So, so, so I'm curious about uh -huh. your thinking about that challenge. Happy to talk about that. Um, well, I mean, we're, we're offering this, this very, it, this is radical, like 1.44 megabytes per minute. You know, it's, it's tiny. You know, we're, we're showing yeah, like the tiny. very furthest that you can go. Um, but what we advocate is, is just for people to, um, to upload and to upload at, you know, like maybe 20 megabytes per minute. You can get lots of resolution in there. And when you're streaming, you know, instead of streaming at 1080 or 720, you know, see how far you can stand to bring it down. It probably depends on, on what you're streaming. But uh, you're, the point that you're making, David, about mm. um, audience's interest, um, it, it is, it's, it's a really good point. Um, and I think that uh, using McLuhan's terms of uh, push media and pull media, mm. you know, 4K or something like that, that of course is pushing out at you and you're, you know, receiving it and kind of, you know, made passive by it. Whereas uh, low resolution and small, small file movies, they're pull media. So they pull you in, but you have to be inclined. Um, it's also a little bit similar to my, my concepts of, uh, of uh, optical visuality and haptic visuality, where you know, mm. haptic visuality, you have to like go toward it with your own, with your whole body. So, yeah, so there's the, in, the, the question of um, whether audiences are interested. And uh, I think there are lots of ways to make people interested, for example, with the soundtrack. But, you know, I really think about, um, you know, immersion. Mm -hmm. I think that um, any media can be immersive. You just have to immerse yourself in it. Mm -hmm. And I find this, I find uh, Night Tender to be completely immersive. Like, yeah. I don't know exactly what I'm immersing in, but I, I just, I almost feel like I'm drowning in it. I don't know if other people do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think your reference to McLuhan there is really apt. It's almost, because he was very, he was famously um, unhappy with, with the, the the sort of complete Im, complete visual field that you mm -hmm. get from your eyes and how how distancing perspective is as you're sort of separate from the image and his relationship between um, audio perception audio presentation versus visual and he's talking always about the intervals mm -hmm. and all these sorts of things I think that image that that film is one that really like pulls the image away from the visual space mm -hmm. that McLuhan was concerned about into that 
much more engaged space that he imagined the acoustic as giving. Yeah. So it's very much mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And it does engage you in a totally different way. Mm. I wonder, have, do you guys get any submissions from, um, there's a whole movement of people who are doing uh, algorithmic image generation mm -hmm. that fits in a tweet. So you oh. have to write, you have to write mm -hmm. code. It's usually in, J in JavaScript mm -hmm. or Java for J5S or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So it has to fit in a tweet. And some of them are absolutely remarkable. But what's weird there is they're actually very high resolution because it's algorithmic. They can be mm -hmm. 8K but they're entirely contained in a tweet. Mm -hmm. they, they generally, they're not generally narrative, they generally are kind of immersive worlds or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a different, it's again a totally different aesthetic because mm -hmm. it's operating very much on like how, how much complexity can I get from a, a, a minimal number of calculations? Mm -hmm. well, we've received, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same thing, but we have received some ex executable files. Mm -hmm. Um, so that they travel tiny, and then they um, they perform themselves algorithmically, right. you know, upon receipt, mm -hmm. and that that is very cool. <laughs> yeah, so that's I'm always looking over to make sure the camera hasn't run out of batteries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Folks out there have uh, comments or questions. If I come close, you will be recorded. Okay. Yeah, and um, McLuhan, 1964, and the distinction between hot and cool media. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, print was hot because it was the visual medium. So you got to be careful not to misunderstand McLuhan when he was talking about TV. Mm -hmm. He wasn't talking about what's odd about his, his argument about TV is that it's not a visual medium at all because McLuhan's print mind, 500 mm -hmm. centuries of print, was the visual medium par excellence. So when after after radio, hot print radio, come the electronic media and television is there coming into the living rooms of post suburban America in black and white. Mm -hmm. And then it's the the technology of the cathode ray tube, mm -hmm. which so many lines per second. And so that's what leads him to draw on uh, if the newspaper is kind of a mosaic, the, the television, the scanned image of black and white TV, low resolution, was cool. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't visual at all. It was, it was haptic, as you said. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the ratio between the eye and the, the finger. Yeah. Uh, because the eye is being used as a finger mm -hmm. to fill in mm -hmm. the image is incomplete by low definition mm -hmm. and so there's the, the filling in which is the coolness of it the, the cool medium being the one that demands the most audience participation mm -hmm. so uh McLuhan might be some some help here yeah um, mm -hmm. but we push the analysis of haptics further his his analysis of that was based on the science he was reading and I'm pretty sure uh, from the sources, the scientific source, because he was a Renaissance kind of writer, right? You know, literary sources looked at, at Shakespeare for his metaphor of the electric light, blah, blah, blah. Um, but also he, where he, he referenced science, it was a certain stage of science. And I, I think probably that it wouldn't hold up today. His, mm. his analysis of the, of, the, of the tactility of mm -hmm. the image I think other people have come along and, and critiqued it because mm -hmm. it, the science he based that kind of understanding of that medium on and its haptics has been kind of well transformed because mm -hmm. image technology has been transformed and then all, all of that you know the evolution of, of tv yeah. as a medium then on top of that but yeah it's important to remember his theory is, is situated in a certain history in the moment mm -hmm. of development. Yeah, th thank, thank you for that summary. That, that's, uh, that's very helpful. Yeah, there, there, are, uh, there are other ways to, to think about um, images being uh, haptic or um, inviting haptic visuality that um, 
I use a different set of reference points. Like I use um, uh, uh, Henri Bergson and um, um, how memory and embodied memory um, informs the way we grasp an image. Hi, Willie. Hi. I was just, just following on, on what your, your, your evocation of this uh, um, festival and this movement. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just reminded of uh, this trajectory and I think is in a line of flight away from, um, do you have cameras? <laughs> <laughs> Microphone. Uh, this line of flight, flight from this conundrum. I am your Zoom audience. <laughs> okay, <laughs> David. Um, this line of flight away from this conundrum of, of the, the drive towards deeper immersion and, and um, more investment in the image. Uh, I think the line of flight is, is in the audio and mm. I speak of it as a larger trend. Uh, I think uh, an evolution of our relation with the image out of, in a larger society is, is in the immediate future of computing and media, it's gonna be audio or inter interface with the coming um, form of the internet. I think Be becoming what? Our interface with the larger forms of the internet will mm. be through an audio interface. And I, I think there'll be a de-emphasis on, on uh, image. And, mm. um, and, and indeed, I think the trajectory is connected in that audio in McLuhan's acoustic space is, 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 is deeper immersion. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a kind of fulfillment of, of image, I think it's in, in uh, mm -hmm. you know, something that we're all immersed in. It's a kind of, in some ways, a transcendence of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of image, and, you know, that, uh, and I think that's upon us. Like it's huh. kind of the earbuds and the sophisticated, um, you know, text to speech, speech to text, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is, I think that's, mm -hmm. that's where we're at. Yeah, well, that, that's a very uh, attractive speculation, though. I mean, you know, if your, your example of somebody like listening with earbuds, they, they are still using their eyes for something. Um, mm -hmm. And but I, I'm thinking that um, the difference might be that uh, visually, people can multitask or, or believe that they can multitask with, you know, several screens or even like, you know, the live, live scene in front of them. Whereas I think that with audio, you can't really multitask. I don't know. I don't, I, I'd ask my, I'd ask audio experts. So I think, you know, the immersion might simply might be because that's the only thing you're doing. And I think it would be a nice relief for people. I like this idea. I went the opposite direction for a while. I decided not to add any sound to any of my artworks unless it was absolutely necessary. Only because I saw so many students adding sound thoughtlessly to everything mm. because their reference is YouTube videos and every YouTube video has audio and it mm. drove me insane. So I made a promise to myself, I said, okay, like I was, I was at a symposium, uh, Simon Fraser, uh, when I was doing a show at Presentation House Gallery in Vancouver, and someone got up and said, omni-media, multimedia, all the time, everything, I love it, it's fantastic. And I was on stage going, do I believe that? And mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's the artist's right to limit you to one sense. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a very powerful, expressive mm -hmm. thing. And that, so, so I, I tried to play <laughs> I tried to be true to my word on that. Mm. Although I love sound as a medium more than I love visuals. I love sound as a medium, but, uh, but I think I, I'm more concerned about what the visual medium does to us. So I've been more drawn to, mm -hmm. to explore it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, um, uh, I don't want uh, an aesthetic of scarcity to sound um, off-putting. Um, so maybe it's not the right term, but I really think it would be a, just a, a great relief to a lot of people if, if we had, you know, just imagine, imagine if we had, like going back to um, streaming and the, the cornucopia paradigm, you know, imagine if we had like only, um, you know, 10 movies that we could all watch <laughs> at a time, 
Yeah, we would really enjoy them. We would talk about them together. We'd study them in detail. Um, we would, you know, get to know them very intimately. Or even if we change that to, you know, you know, a thousand movies, that would still be a a tiny proportion of what's currently sitting on, um, you know, uh, the servers of Netflix and other video platforms. Going to put a lot of directors out of work. Yeah. Uh, well, but, <laughs> mm, but we would, yeah, but we would, uh, we would appreciate their work more, and and you know, who maybe we maybe they get paid for the same. Pay the same amount. Um, I, I, I had I I was I I had a chance to reflect on the extreme case of that. Mm -hmm. I was visiting a a very strange um, collection uh, in the mountains behind Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. The um, it's a collection of light and kinetic art mm -hmm. on a miniature pony farm. Um, but they had some they, a, a miniature pony farm on a miniature a pony farm, farm, a farm, of, farm miniature of miniature ponies. ponies. Yeah, yeah, farmers of miniature ponies, but with the most incredible light and uh, kinetic art collection, everything working. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was working was an early 20th century Lumia set. So this was where they had some sort of like bits of metal or something and a light source and a sort of a rear projection screen. And it would sort of just create these shifting lights. And it was in the form of like a, a sort of a pre-television television form. Mm -hmm. So kind of a wooden cabinet with a screen. And the dream of the creator, whose name I've forgotten, was that the family would gather around and share this visual experience. Mm. It was kind of like the visual equivalent of, 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 of music, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, it was quite, it was, it was beautiful and mesmerizing, but it was, the, that was, that was the, 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 the early, the pre-television mm -hmm. vision of, sh of shared mm -hmm. visual consumption. Well, you, you mentioned earlier, David, that um, when people can't see things clearly or perhaps hear things clearly, they fill them in with imagination and invention. And I think that's true in the best case, but people also fill them in with um, expectation based mm -hmm. on you know, what we have seen and heard before. But I do think that in that in that withdrawal, there's an in invitation for people to be a little more creative. And I'm actually I'm so glad you came, Willie, because I rem I'm remembering that this piece that you and Eric Rosenzweig mm -hmm. made, you know, probably more than 20 years ago. Oh, yes, the appearance machine, mm -hmm. where um, this camera, the camera is um, surveying this kind of um, conveyor belt mm -hmm. that's kind of making making little bits of colorful trash move around and um, and the resolution is very low and uh, I just loved it and um, uh, you know you and Eric mentioned uh, somebody came to you and said I thought it was great but um, uh, why is the woman in the third act Asian <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so people uh, this is a weird question, but you know, meaning that people um, they ascribe we ascribe things, we use our imaginations. If there's something that pulls us in, well, this, this mosaic uh, aesthetic it, it 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 sort of implies distance from the screen. It uh, increases the resolution. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of paradox of, uh, of right. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I, but, well, the opposite works too. I had this experience where I was doing a projection of an installation, which you saw actually projected onto sand <laughs> years ago. So it's a projection onto sand mm -hmm. of various images. And I was doing a little mock-up in my studio and it looked terrible because I had to use like horrible MPEG of some ancient era compression on the video. And on the little screen, it looked awful. And I thought, oh God, if I put it on a three meter by four meter floor, it's going to look terrible. I, put, I projected and it looked great. And the reason was the artifacts were too big to mm. see. Huh. They were too big. So it looked fabulous, which was really surprising. Mm -hmm. Also the sand. the sand. Well, the sand helped. The sand helped, but it, even with the sand was flat, the, the, it, it was really spooky. The artifacts did not fit into my phobia. If the artifacts fit into my phobia, they were obvious. And as soon yeah. as it was 
like immersion, the immersion in the, in the larger image, mm -hmm. completely counterintuitively mm -hmm. looked wonderful. I was completely, I was, I was so confused by that. It took me a while to, to <laughs> digest really, it. Yeah, I think the foveal, the foveal vision is really an important, important point. In I'm fascinated way. by the fovea, mm -hmm. fascinated by the fovea. No, I actually want to um, go back to, so like you kind of made me remind, like I had a, a question beforehand and now you reminded me why I, I want to ask the question. So it's kind of like in between, uh, like an education, like education and uh, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah, but it's not just education. Well, anyway, so, um, um, so many times uh, when you're uh, doing, uh, so when, when you were working with media, uh, I found that, um, especially in the early days, um, the only way in which I could uh, compress things, in, in which I could fit things into smaller space was if I knew the medium. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, this so by by forcing uh, yourself to to place your movies or to create media into a smaller space, you might end up knowing the medium better. Mm -hmm. And oh, absolutely! Not just uh, using this as as a way to like as a strategy to um, to just create stuff with less. Uh, um, resources, but also as a way to know the, the mm -hmm. medium better, mm -hmm. and therefore to become more innovative with mm -hmm. the medium. Itself. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and that there's there's so many methods besides the ones that I've I've showed showed you here that all you know, they just show so much creative thinking. But there's a little bit. Well, I mean, you you mentioned two things, Roberta, which I think are not really um, disparate. Um, one is, um, you know, trying to um, you know, do a lot with less resources, and the other is knowing the medium. So, of course, the, the more you know your medium, the more, you know, the more elegantly you can, um, you can use it. Um, but yeah, the art artists use uh, at the festival use so many other beautiful techniques, like um, making a narrative out of uh, still images with uh, a beautiful soundtrack. Or, um, I'm thinking of, uh, like of Chris Marker's yes, like uh, La Jete, Jete, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. yeah, La Jete is a small file movie. Yeah, um, and very, very compelling, mm -hmm. completely, completely compelling. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. there are, but, but yeah, it's, it's a very good point that, um, you know, I think, I think even, it even shows respect for the, the medium. Mm -hmm. the, Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you raised these questions. Um, I've, I've elided a lot of things that would help to, to, to answer some of them. Um, and one thing that we, we advocate is um, going to the movies. Um, if you want, or, or going to, you know, to see a video installation, if you want to see a gorgeous, luscious, um, high resolution image. You were entirely talking about, or we're mostly talking about streaming. Um, so we're not, I'm not saying we must only watch small file movies, but I am saying we need to be aware of um, the, the, um, the electricity use and the uh, fossil fuel you know, um, support for, for streaming. Um, yeah, and also uh, television. It's much better to watch television than to stream in terms of carbon footprint. Um, but you, but you, your question was more complex than that, Catherine. So let me just think a little bit. Um, I think it's a real challenge mm -hmm. to bring that to the consciousness. Right? Mm -hmm. We can solve the rhetoric of how many decades mm -hmm. now of social. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frictionless mm -hmm. transfer of data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And yeah. these things, these things have all, they have. You know, their seductive lies that have uh, pulled us into a very bad state. And you know, maybe 4% doesn't sound so bad, but it is the same as the airline industry, which everybody is really upset about, and it's expanding fast. And I, I mentioned um, that those efficiencies are going to come to an end, the efficiency of Moore's law and the efficiency of, um, uh, there's another law about, um, uh, uh, anyway, I forget the name of the other law. Uh, Kumi's law. So Moore's law is about um, uh, this uh, um, increase in transistor yeah, density, double, basically. Yeah, yeah. the du yeah. doubling of um, uh, the density of circuits every year and a half to two years. And Kumi's law is um, about increase of efficiency of um, networks. So um, they're coming to an end partly because, well, the Moore's Law is coming to an end because uh, with miniaturization, um, there's some, at some point, circuits get so small um, that um, it's something to do with the inverse, uh, inverse ratio of the voltage. They get so small that uh, electrons start to leak out of the circuits. And that's actually... You know, where, where yeah. we're and, the, at. and there are quantum effects as well. So mm -hmm. it's so yeah, it's we're, we are yeah. hitting a wall there for sure. So yeah. so this means that that like um, uh, efficiency of data centers that's maintained at a steady state for about ten years is it's going to start to spike, and um, you know, all the and the the efficiencies of the other technologies as well, and so that will mean a lot more electricity use. Um, and you know, with with the you know, even though you know, the use of uh, renewable energy is increasing, as I said, it's only increasing to um, to accommodate the in, the overall increase of electricity use. Right, so, but there is an interesting mm -hmm. challenge there, right? Because there, that steady state scenario for fossil fuel seems to be part of the mm -hmm. petro oligarchic sort of I, that's not well, the right, right word but it's like about was about data centers right but in but in general mm -hmm. there is because even though the the cost of renewable 
energy is declining and the amount that's, that's possible is going up, there are vested interests that are making sure that fossil fuels continue to be used for all sorts, in all sorts of weird government, mm -hmm. government um, uh, support, which creates a situation where there's not the pressure. There would be the capacity Mm -hmm. in, in the absence of that to actually reduce the, 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 green, the, the, mm -hmm. the greenhouse gas footprint mm -hmm. of these data centers. But there are other political forces at play, mm -hmm. political and financial forces that are causing that to be negated. Mm -hmm. So that's a, so I, I see there's like two challenges. I agree with Catherine. My daughter would totally buy into this, but my daughter is not the average Netflix. Mm -hmm. She's using old camcorders. She likes the aesthetic. She wants, she wants, right. she wants that the tactility of that media. Mm -hmm. But that's not your average viewer. Right. And so, you're absolutely right. Everything you say, but convincing the consumer mm -hmm. in a way that's actually tangibly going to make a difference I, is I the part that I get confused. Okay, I have excellent. An answer. That's what I was thinking excellent. of when, when you were talking, Catherine. It is. Um, it actually, like I think. You know, I love what we do at the festival, but I think, but what we're actually going to start doing this year, you know, not as probably not as part of the festival, but at least as part of our education um, campaign, is uh, medium files. You know, showing you know showing people that um, you know files that are still a, a very small proportion of standard streaming, you know, look look just great. So I'm talking, you know, not 1.4, 1.4. Or four megabytes, but you know, 20 megabytes per minute or so, you know, for streaming, those will look great. So, you know, I almost, I don't think that we made a mistake by starting out so small because we wanted, I think we've started an aesthetic movement. Yeah, you made a point. Really you staked, put your flag mm -hmm. in the ground clearly. Uh, with yeah, that. and yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I think the results are fantastic. Mm. But uh, to, you know, exactly, to get people to buy in, we have to say, look, you know, instead of 7, 720, you know, 360, or instead of, instead of um, uh, you know, 200 megabytes per minute, try 50 or 20. So that, that will be, and I hope it's not going to be only us that are doing all this education work, but I think that's going to be the next step. And I think, I think, well, and the other way that I do think it will happen is I actually think that a true cost accounting is coming. Um, sometimes I think that. Sometimes I don't. But you know, if um, you know, say, say the Canadian government required um, streaming platforms and telecoms to um, you know to really pay for the end-to-end -end, um, um, uh, footprint of of um, of their their services, mm -hmm. then those would get really expensive. Mm -hmm. And they would um, pass that cost onto the con consumer. Yeah. What? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So there, there would be a lot of upsides. Mm -hmm. I have a question actually regarding that. So do you find that uh, uh, during the pandemic, the program will be streaming and everything as things being exacerbated? Mm -hmm. Yes. This, mm -hmm. this is what I, I read, but I haven't seen the data. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and we, we we began our research right at the beginning of the pandemic. So. Um, in March 
2020, maybe March, March and April, a couple months, um, there was so much demand on um, uh, streaming platforms that um, uh, some platforms reduced their maximum capacity, maximum um, size to um, uh, maximum resolution to 7, 720. Um, Netflix, YouTube, and PlayStation, I think. And that actually shows um, kind of to the detriment of this argument in a way that um, the networks were are uh, over engineered because they were they were not at full capacity or they didn't exceed capacity until that point in the pandemic when everybody was stuck at home uh, streaming movies so uh, you know, some, like some engineers who, who use a criterion of efficiency, which is actually, you know, it's not, it's not, not really a good criterion, but they say, look, networks and data centers are so efficient that we can, uh, you know, handle enormous, enormous loads um, without, without any pressure, except in kind of emergency situations like the, the beginning of the pandemic. But that's because um, networks and data centers are, are engineered to um, are over engineered in case of disaster. And what a disaster is, is defined by you know, the capitalist economy as um, the platform goes down for a few seconds and somebody uh, you know, turns it off and switches to another platform. I drifted a bit, but did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Another question about the transition to clean from what clean energy mm -hmm. uh, that factors in to basically clean. Mm -hmm. uh, clean yeah, well, the transition is not happening fast enough um, to um, to reach the Paris Climate Accords um, criterion uh, by twenty thirty. Just absolutely no way. Uh, and I, I've mentioned a couple of times that it doesn't really look like it's going to be a transition. It looks like it's going to be an addition, right? Um, sorry, I hate it when people say right. <laughs> but it, it, look, it looks that way because um, uh, electricity demand around the world is increasing and around the world, People are, um, or governments and private individuals and companies are, are uh, installing more um, sustainable uh, energy uh, generation. But so far, I mean, you, you can look at it like country by country, but so far, um, that 79% of um, global energy sources coming from fossil fuels has um, maintained. For the last few years, yeah, maybe we'll see a little drop, um, but I don't know. You know, like with um, the war in Ukraine and now the the war in Gaza. Um, you know, China um, is um, uh, building new coal plants, and um, you know, all kinds of things happen, and people fall back on fossil fuels. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I see that too. The actual windmill, which seems like a great idea, they are made of carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. and they're just un you can't recycle. Yeah. So there are vast areas of the old wind turbines. And I lived in outside of the uh, Ruby, the essence outside of Cologne. Mm -hmm. My friend took me to a place and there was a village that they were taking it apart. And, and I asked them, why are they taking it apart and selling the machines or something? Mm. They're going to eat the village. And I was like, what are you talking about? Are you this like, is the, this is the huge like coal thing? Yeah. There was a huge mm -hmm. pit, which is like 30 miles long by 20 miles, yeah. and a giant factory burning all the brown coal. And they were actually digging up the, the town because it was on this coal, coal field. Mm. So they were actually digging up coal villages. Whole, whole wow. just to, to burn it mm -hmm. to power our city. I guess, I guess 
Well, because there are new technologies, new innovative energy producing technologies that aren't really, uh, that come out of the cold fusion um, research that was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and would that make a difference, in, in your opinion, if we could find a way to transition to a truly recyclable, mm -hmm. uh, clean energy? Mm -hmm. Would it be a problem that we are increasing our, our data mm -hmm. usage? Because, I mean, I, I've seen things in Norway where there's an entire um, data center there. And it's, it's in somewhere very cold because they can open the window and, 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 uh, and, and actually um, cool it mm -hmm. by the, the, the cold air. But, yeah. but if there was a clean energy source, would that make a difference mm -hmm. to this problem? Uh, well, I mean, cer certainly it would, but I think it's just very, I think it's important not to get, um, you know, to put our hopes in um, future, futuristic scenarios. Um, and I, I, I really think that, um, that whatever, whatever we humans on earth do, it's going to be necessary to, um, to cut back our consumption. And that's us in the wealthy countries. Like we are completely the source of this problem. Um, you know, even in, even in the best of case, you know, think like, you know, uh, you know, as we know, you know, um, you know, electric vehicles and things, they, they need a lot of lithium and, you know, lithium mining has its own, you know, ecological yeah, and humanitarian. A lot of electricity. Mm -hmm. And because they're heavier, because mm -hmm. they're heavier, there's more tire shredding mm -hmm. stuff, polluting. Yeah, it's like, mm. Yeah, so. It's so, hard to. So I, re I really think it's important to, um, to model making do with less as a pleasurable thing, you know, not only necessary, but something that we can really enjoy. And it's just going to require, you know, ignoring some of the messages, um, you know, that the capitalist economy kind of um, builds, builds into, into us about, uh, you know, increase and bounty and plenty and, you know, infinite choice, um, it's kind of buying out of that fiction. I guess I guess I have a friend in developing countries who was telling me you're just trying to keep the status quo by saying mm -hmm. we're not allowed. Mm -hmm. You're using your advantage of a hundred years of this energy use, and now you're telling us mm -hmm. as yeah. we're developing that we're not allowed to do that. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. in essence an economic tool to keep us at this level and mm -hmm. at this level. Yeah, but it has dialogue that's moved past that idea of like, oh, it's going to pass mm -hmm. developing countries. And more, it's now time to refer to uh, degrowth for the global north. That's it. Um, and then uh, actually, the, at the government level, um, funding transference to the global south countries with an eye to whatever is possible, right? Sustainable growth. But of course, that's, the, that's where the treatment goes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if, if you're in the opposite position, you see it from a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think anybody wants to keep anything growing. It's just a question of how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. There's a term that I really like um, coming from uh, engineering, which is collapse informatics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the idea that uh, that um, you know, what. Uh, what kind of computing would we have and what kind of um, ICT would we have? It basically like after peak oil and uh, when, when the scarcity of um, uh, sources for electricity uh, has become clear. And you know, to prepare for that with a light heart means you know, living more like people in, you know, Rwanda is actually kind of my ideal because um, Rwanda actually has decent infrastructure, you know, everybody can get 2G or 3G, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. Um, uh, renewable energy, I think Rwanda uses mostly hydro. I think we should actually all become like Rwanda. And we're like, yeah, okay, I can stream a movie slowly, or maybe instead of streaming, you know, we'll, we'll download a movie, you know, once or twice a week. Um, 
you know, we'll go to the local movie theater. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make a pleasure out of scarcity. So, so the point that you made is it, it is very important that it, it does appear that uh, people from the rich countries are saying, oh no, you, you all can't make mistakes, mistakes that we did. But um, I think in, in fact, or at least in principle, you know, it has to be the wealthy countries first making a few sacrifices. Mm. And you know, it's gonna be hardly any skin off our ass at all. You know, people are barely gonna notice a difference. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I could put an optimistic spin on this, <laughs> but I feel that our experience through the COVID epidemic and our experience of the current political situation and the pretty remarkable collapse of concerted government effort to mm -hmm. control climate change indicates that there's either a failure of public will or a failure of leadership. Which is which has put us in a really difficult spot, yeah. and that that um, it's that it becomes a challenge how, how to how to engage usefully, yeah. given that scenario. How to I, I, like I don't even know honestly where to start. Mm -hmm. I mean, a small file film festival is a great place to start, well, but it's, it's I don't know if it gets us to where. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what I, you know, I, you know, I decided to just focus on one thing. Yep. And um, you know, the festival is part of it, but um, uh, there's more interest in, in my and our research on the carbon, pile, carbon footprint of streaming because there's just been a gap around that. And you know, it is, um, you know, we are reaching more audiences in different ways. Uh, about that, and um, and I think it helps to to focus on one thing that you know, it's huge and complex. But yeah. um, um, no, I think it's great research. It a, it's really interesting research it. you could do, mm -hmm. your team yeah. has done. Um, we're just yeah, we're trying to get it out as much as we can, yeah. and I think there's a to do that. There's a and, and there's part. a there's a, a around so streaming is one segment of network infrastructure the cloud etc but what we've seen partly as a in relationship to this has been a migration so back in the 60s and 70s that was also the cloud you had your timeshare computer mm -hmm. in a big room somewhere mm -hmm. and people on terminals right. all over uh, getting you know 300 baud data back and forth that was the cloud the cloud was the original mm -hmm. plan the personal computer revolution was an aberration or a deviation mm -hmm. or a disruption of that plan to put the processor in your home mm -hmm. under your control mm -hmm. and just as the uh, but now we're seeing a reversion to the original plan which actually puts more power in mm -hmm. in a centralized mm -hmm. scenario where it can be monetized more efficiently mm -hmm. but it and it masks you know cloud it was an amazing branding exercise because it it exactly works against what you're trying to do mm -hmm. what someone like trevor paglin has been trying to do etc to make visible that this not is not a zero cost scenario mm -hmm. but it's interesting to think about the power politics of that it's similar mm -hmm. to what's happening on the network the, the the network infrastructure starts in a different way right because it starts with with the with darpa net which was intentionally decentralized mm -hmm. right? and, and able to be disrupted in various ways and survive. But it's, it's over the past 20 years has become massively centralized mm -hmm. and all the data is being pumped through a very, very specific places controlled in certain ways, et cetera. So there's been, again, um, the, the promise of, the, of that, I'm not even talking about the promise of the 90s internet, I'm talking about the promise of the, of the 70s, 60s mm -hmm. and 70s internet. And the promise of the personal com computer revolution, we've been going retrograde on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, not, not the internet. The, internet's, the internet's gone the opposite way because it was the military priority was uh, five nuclear bombs can hit the states and the network would still survive because there were routes around it. Mm -hmm. And it's less resilient now, yes. Yeah. Social and financial control. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah, you can stop access. You can also monitor communications mm -hmm. more efficiently. You know. Um, yeah. As yeah. it's happening in Gaza, as happens yeah. in Kashmir. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it's interesting that back then it was like, oh, what's the military advantage? Mm -hmm. Now, what's the military advantage? Making sure there isn't mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to mention another, um, another aspect to uh, um, this um, dynamic between centralization and decentralization, which uh, I just know a little about, which is um, edge computing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, I'm not remembering the term, but um, you know, what, it, multiple multiple connected servers. You know, there's not not just the term, the yeah. cloud. Hmm? Yeah, I think so. So this actually um, uh, it means so it means that there are, that like the difference between server and network right. actually is getting blurred because there are many more you know local servers you know near the endpoint of transmission. And also, with AI applications in particular, a lot of that work is getting passed on to the user's device. So some of the calculations are happening in the server, some are happening into the device. Um, and something that I didn't mention when I, I mentioned the three components of ICT are um, data centers or servers, networks, and devices, you know, each of which about a third, networks a little less, um, uh, but uh, data centers more, but the, the part, the portion of devices is increasing a lot. Um, and most of this is because of manufacturing energy. Um, so when we receive our phones, um, uh, if we use, if we keep it for two years, um, then that phone um, 85 to 90% of its electricity consumption happened in the factory. Yeah. So, so all this to say, um, one of the best things that con consumers can do to minimize that carbon footprint is to keep our devices for longer and not have too many of them. But because uh, edge computing and maybe mesh computing, there's another term that I have. Yeah, I so me mesh, mesh networking is, is a situation where you could have a bunch of computers that all kind of become network extenders mm -hmm. for each other. Um, yeah. Used a lot in developing countries, but the mm -hmm. one laptop per child system right. was very much mesh, mesh network configured, yeah. for example. That was one of the big proponents of it. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people have mesh networks in their home to extend as kind of right. a way to extend their Wi-Fi through their home, but, yeah, so but I, it's a more interesting idea at core than that yeah. simple So example. that's actually not what I'm thinking but of. But edge is I'm, where you have, yeah, you have some of the computing at the, at the edge device, exactly. some of it at the data center. Yeah, and you, yeah, you, yeah that's it. Yeah. So yeah. A, lot of, a lot of applications using edge computing are passing, passing that labor on to the device. And you know, I just know anecdotally a number of people whose devices have been fried by, um, um, by uh, like certain um, uh, video conferencing apps or, yeah. and if, if, you use, if you use AI and even very casual applications like to blur the background in a Zoom call, you'll probably notice your computer heating up, don't you? <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, AI is a very interesting I example of a solution and a problem because you can use AI to develop extremely efficient codecs for compression. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's potentially extremely good at that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the pressure, especially recently, has been to generate AIs that with broader and broader scope. Mm -hmm. So large language models like ChatGPT mm -hmm. are trying to be an expert about everything. Mm -hmm. And the energy use, it's extremely inefficient to make something that is so broad as that. So we have this conflictual situation where in theory you could you could set AI working on really great ener uh, engineering optimization mm -hmm. or whatever but we are we seem to be asking the wrong questions of AI, uh, of AI mm -hmm. in that sense and in effect pushing so you probably know that AI also generates or requires a lot of energy especially the training process exactly. for AI systems yeah. um, insane amount um, it might even it might even outstrip streaming. It know. probably it probably does outstrip streaming for the for the training of mm -hmm. them. Yeah, and 
Yeah, so it's a tricky, it's a tricky, this is a spa I, space I spend more time thinking about yeah. because mm -hmm. we are here in an AI lab. Yeah. Um, so uh, do, you any, do you think about the efficiency of AI? Is that one of your criteria? Um, to not, not, uh, it's not a primary criteria because mm -hmm. the, the criteria in this space is that we try to find ways to make AI work in the context of live performance. Mm. So, so that is the priority is, mm -hmm. is, is real time, real bodies, real humans. Um, but we run, we run it all locally. Mm -hmm. So we know we have a big GPU. It does, it burns, it's 300 watts. So it mm -hmm. uses more energy than, well, maybe not as much energy as these lights actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't tell. But it's not in, inconsiderable, but it's not a lot. But the training of the models we use right. probably used a huge amount. Yeah. So it is a it is a is a really complicated question, mm -hmm. and it similarly could fall into the same mm -hmm. scenario as streaming, where mm -hmm. we kind of imagine because it's sort of like it's vapor, it's cloud, it's invisible, it's ideas. It shouldn't have any weight. It shouldn't have any gravitational force. It shouldn't use any energy. Right. That's that's that's. It's easy to imagine a way the energy it requires mm -hmm. until you feel that your device has got really hot mm -hmm. and that's the most that's the most graphic experience we have of the energy use of our systems mm -hmm. so it's, it's tricky i found myself to really backtrack for a second i found mm -hmm. myself wondering what would happen if if there was a if there was a netflix competitor that said that that just made it a policy that they would only use green energy for from end to end Mm -hmm. And then made that a market uh, like that. That this is our selling point. Yeah. Would that? Well, does that, that that would. I mean, that would be super hard to calculate yes, because of um, you know just in the way that uh, uh, Apple and Alphabet pretend that their data centers are are um, uh, fueled by renewable energy, but in fact they're sucking <laughs> renewable renewable sourced electricity out of the grid and forcing other people. To use fossil fuels. So, I mean, I'm sure it would be great if somebody, you know, came up with such a, a platform. But, um, but we, we would have happen. to really yeah. check check their accounting very yeah. well. Absolutely. But I was just thinking pragmatically. Mm -hmm. If there was a service that's like, okay, we are a streaming service. We, you know, somehow we 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 help people understand that there is a cost. There's an energy energy so greenhouse gas cost to this. It's probably impossible, but if it's impossible, then I'm just even more depressed. Well, um, okay, let me let me just give it a thought. The trail is exchange carbon footprint. And so the first thing I thought of was to go back to your issue about the awareness of our carbon footprint. And, you know, the art project, which is the is another great example in the history of the aesthetic of media affordances and constraints, right? They mm -hmm. go hand in hand in the whole history of media. And so you found a little niche of media, and another niche for Polaroid cameras and mm -hmm. for audio, like all of those media have their subcultures and aesthetics. So you're in that, and I like that a lot. But the missing element here is the, the awareness of our comfort. So the app, why aren't on my smartphone, all your smartphones for every mm -hmm. transaction of data. There, there are such or downloading, apps. The same thing that happens when you buy an airline ticket. Mm -hmm. you, you can know your carbon. Yep, there, there, there do pay, exist such you apps. Pay to offset it. So why can't we have that model blown up and force the telecoms, the platform capitalists of the world, on the device, on mm -hmm. the edge computing device, to calculate the carbon footprint every time we make a transaction so that with like the weather, it becomes as familiar as the weather and yep. the temperature. Yep. You know your carbon footprint. I love this so much, but I think the the uh, carbon offset system doesn't, doesn't work. work. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's complete. Yeah. It's complete. But yeah, like, it it could be it could be doable. The technological solutionism, which got us here in the first place, that's a dead end. Yes. And the crisis mm -hmm. is built up so much that I think the elephant really is consumption, and I'm totally with you on mm -hmm. that. Yes. 
it's the aesthetic oh. of scarcity and mm -hmm. conservation well, and all that because we're way we're over consuming it, it's consumption our, but and it's in our mm -hmm. invisible in the carbon footprint yeah it's consumption but it it's not it's not only the consumer's fault and the the solutions and there are some very very easy solutions that begin with consumers like you know stream in lower resolution uh, keep your phone for longer but uh, it's important not to um, put all the blame on the com consumers because um you know it is um uh you know it's telecoms it's a uh, data center network companies Mm -hmm. the, sy ah. the system mm -hmm. the system yeah. of mm -hmm. consumption Cons yes yeah. yes yes and then i agree mm -hmm. with you completely mm -hmm. so this is a very strange angle on this question a very problematic angle in this question but um who's familiar with the with the uh, technocracy movement technocracy i don't think so from the 20s and 30s mm -hmm very popular across North America and into Mexico. Um, the technocrats wanted a culture run by engineers, oh, right. yes. but the, the economic system was that you had a certain number of energy credits mm -hmm. and you could buy things based on how much energy it took to produce them. And that was <laughs> it. Everything was based on energy consumption. It was super rational. They had snazzy, slightly fascist uniforms. <laughs> um, they had their own, they had their big problems. Um, ironically, the head of the Canadian Technocratic Institution uh, got disillusioned, moved to South Africa, had a child, and that person had a child, and that child was Elon Musk. <laughs> 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 and Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. <laughs> yes. And and if you read if you read Elon Musk if you read Elon Musk's plans for Mars he uses the word technocratic in in his thing anyway that's just a side but it's interesting I mean this is the sort of the, the rational solution right we make everything cost exactly what the energy costs mm -hmm. right and then you know and like maybe you know maybe you're you know oh, yeah. i mean i'm not i'm not i'm not suggesting it's actually a solution i'm, I'm, no, I'm I, not I, seriously but i'm just i'm just saying this is this is this is how an engineer might solve it right well no i i, I do think that true true cost accounting, true cost accounting is a solution yeah. it just yeah. has to be you know very well defined and like yeah. you know what what is you know from from mining to disposal i would say and if we did that you know our internet plans would get really expensive. And we'd be like, <laughs> I think I'll walk to the movie theater. Um, <laughs> but it's. No. Of course, of, mm -hmm. totally, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I, I, was, I was not joking about Rwanda, and I, I take seriously the way people in less infrastructured parts of the world are very inventive and make do with less. And, um, you know, don't, you know, and so, and, you know I'm not going to say it's not, uh, there's not hardship in that, but, um, you know, people, people who live with lighter infrastructure really should be the model, you know. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, but I'm not saying zero, like there is something, um, uh, something called like the Internet Poverty Index. So, so they have a measure, um, and they measure you know countries and regions based on you know sufficient access to the internet. So you you can't stream in 4K, but you have what you need you know for for basic infrastructure. Um, so maybe I should. So there, there, there is a happy medium somewhere. There's a nice movement in, in, in Africa to, to install skylights, which give light into air like houses, mm -hmm. and also to create electricity to power your phone and where the lights, to, to put rock in a bucket, and the bucket comes down to the ground and powers a little generator. Oh. Really ways to, uh -huh. to actually, it's very yeah. simple ways but it, it, a lot of it relies on, on technology like LEDs that are mm -hmm. very, very efficient mm -hmm. in their energy. But there are ways to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I keep coming back to the term uh, elegance, because I think both in engineering and in art, 
you know, ele elegance is a criterion for, um, you know, coming up with the best solution with a small number of ingredients uh, in an artful way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think the um, regard for new media and art in general has been like a uh, imperative to look at media like just as a like formal formal component of media and you know this carbon footprint uh, mm -hmm. is is essentially an aesthetic mm -hmm. um, concern a formal yeah. concern. It's basically a, a modernist movement because yeah. mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at mm -hmm. the infrastructure as the, the medium on which, on which we reflect. Well, it's voluntarily accepting the kind of constraints that will likely happen anyway if we don't get our act together. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like there's gonna, there may be a point when small file <laughs> movies are all we have. <laughs> And un unfortunately, unfor unfortunately, we do tend to respond more creatively to an emergency than we do. That the part of the problem is we is 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 yeah mm -hmm. is People yeah. Well, we all know about the problem of trying to frame this as emergency. Oh yeah. It has. Time. Yeah. Really mm -hmm. So I know if people want to stick around, mm -hmm. uh, like I'm happy to. Mm -hmm. But um, just so you know, it's already seven. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, David, and thank, thank you, you, everybody, thank for you this for fabulous you. conversation. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Hi, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, likewise. Uh -huh. Yeah. Welcome to my lair. Reflecting on the material.